Ulysses. Part 2, The Wanderings of Odysseus, Episode 7, Aeolus. The time is about 12 noon, but realistically it's probably later because I have no idea then or now or in between how you would get from Sandy Mount to Glasnevin for a burial, go through the burial, and then get back into town, especially if you're only leaving Sandy Mount about 11 o'clock. The scene is newspaper. In this case, the offices of the Freeman's Journal, lately occupied by the Irish Independent, who took over the Freeman's Journal. Colour is red. The technique is enthymemic. Correspondences include Crawford for Aeolus, uh, journalism for incest, the press for the floating island, uh, Mentor, Ulysses and Telemachus. The science or art of the chapter is rhetoric and the meaning is the mockery of victory. The organs uh, are in this case are the lungs. Symbols include machines, wind, fame, kite, failed destinies and mutability. Some of the other characters who show up include Simon Dedalus, Alexander Keyes, Nanetti, JJ Malloy, Lenehan, and Miles, Miles Crawford and Professor McHugh, or the Professor as he's known. Plot. In the heart of the Hibernian metropolis. After the funeral, Bloom comes to the centre of town to go back to work. He calls into the offices of the Freeman's Journal, a nationalist newspaper that he sells ads for, and he looks to outline a rather ingenious way to have an advertisement placed within for the House of Keys. Nanetti doesn't particularly get it or help him, so Bloom departs to try and find Alexander Keyes. Meanwhile, Stephen Dedalus arrives with DC's letter in his hand and echoes of DC's guff and misogyny in his head. But Crawford, the editor, is much more interested in seeing what Stephen has to write and say for himself. Lenehan is garrulous and entertaining, but when Stephen starts his oratory, he commands the room and leads them into his parable of the plums. Bloom returns in time to get the ending of the parable as the journalists head out to the pub for a liquid lunch. With unfeigned regret it is, we announce the dissolution of a most respected Dublin Burgess. This morning the remains of the late Mr. Patrick Dignam. Machines. Smash a man to atoms if they got him caught. Rule the world today. His machineries are pegging away too. Like these, got out of hand, fermenting, working away tearing away, and that old grey rat tearing to get in. Lenehan's Limerick. There's a ponderous pundit McHugh, who wears goggles of ebony hue, as he mostly sees double to wear them white trouble, I can't see the Joe Miller, can you? Dear Dirty Dublin. Dubliners. Two Dublin Vestals, Stephen said. Elderly and pious have lived fifty and fifty-three years in Fumbley's Lane. Where's that? The professor asked. K-M-R-I-A. He can kiss my royal Irish arse, Miles Crawford cried loudly over his shoulder. Any time he likes, tell him. While Mr. Bloom stood weighing the point and about to smile, he strode on jerkily. Reading this chapter for the first time was what really turned me on to what Joyce was trying to do. I cantered through the earlier ones without realising that I was what I was reading in terms of the various techniques and skills and abilities that Joyce was trying to employ, but this one stood out because of its very newspaperiness. The newspaper headlines mid-article, as was still common at the time I was reading it, was a great break from anything I could expect or had previously expected from a novel. Of course, this isn't the technique that Joyce sets out to use per se, rather it's a reflection of the setting. I haven't really done anything more than mention them so far, but Joyce genuinely uses these techniques that I've been listing, and he has in his schemas, to explore the novel. In this case, it's the enthymeme, an Aristotelian three-part deductive argument, and in one of the applications of it, one or more parts are suppressed. The idea that by giving one or two lines, you can figure out the rest for yourself. It's a context-rich chapter in that regard, and potentially everything is an enthymeme. For example, we aren't told that Crawford is the editor, but it can be deduced. This is also the second time that Bloom and Dedalus overlap, the first having been in Hades, as Bloom spots him from the carriage in Sandy Mount. One of the set pieces of the chapter is Stephen's Parable of the Plums, 
where he tells the story of two old ladies climbing Nelson's column with a bag of plums before arriving at the top and staring up at the statue of the old one-handed adulterer before getting a sore neck and then eating the plums, spitting the stones out through the railings overlooking the busy street. Dedalus and Joyce leave us to fill in the missing conclusions.